Hello, uh, my name's Howard Knopf. I'm a lawyer here in Ottawa. Conrad knows me. We go back a long time. Uh, thank you very much, Conrad. That was that was quite wonderful. And but and I know that you've been a fearless champion of of, of many of many of these things in your various various roles. But there were there were three words, three C words that even you, being as outspoken as you can be, did not mention. And I wonder if they helped the debate. One is copyright. One is convergence. And one is capture, as in regulatory capture. I know those are all things that you've worked very hard to improve, and I think you've made your mark. But I see these as, as, as issues that fit into all of the things you've talked about and are being used in, in negative ways in Canada and, uh, and also probably should be thrown into the mix for, for improvement. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, I absolutely agree with you. It should be thrown in the mix, but look at the topic. It says communication and competition, you know. <laughs> If, I mean, copyright, yes, is a big competition issue. You don't have to, I am only too well aware of it. But there's only so much you can, can cram into a 40-minute pre presentation. Corruption, huge problem with any regulator. And I've seen it firsthand. You know, it's when you always deal with one problem, always interact with some, with one industry, after a while you start thinking like them. It is, and I don't think anybody knows the solution with it, but it's something you have to be very well aware of and, and, uh, and, and deal with it. And convergence, well, I, I, I didn't use the word because it's so over word, but I mean, uh, what we have seen in our whole uh, economy is the convergence. I mean, if, well, all, the convergence, which convergence do you want to talk about in content and carriage? Well, it certainly is there. You know, broadcast telecom, it's there, etc. I mean, it, it's just sort of become an all. It, it, you're right, I should have used the word, but I, I think I, I made it clear that the concept is alive and well. Great talk. Yeah. Uh, free trade agreements. Yeah. Past and upcoming, like the European and Union trade agreement. What's your opinion, your experience with these as it affects, you know, broadcasting? Well, they, hopefully they will lead to further liberalization. Trade agreements are a wonderful way for doing something domestically, which is very painful and which you can't do normally, but you can do it as part of a great. We know, all know it's good, but it actually harm, hurts some particular segment. And so if you can put it as part of a great deal, we are opening the, this market. And as part of this, you know, so let's say, for instance, our dairy industry, which we all know is, is, an, is, is, is very harmful to the economic development, costs us a lot of money. Nobody likes to touch it because of dairy farmers' strengths. And you say, but this... We would open it as in order to enter the European market. It may make it politically more saleable. Same thing in, com uh, in our uh, communication. I can, can we, uh, do, we could open up our, uh, our broadcasting industry. Do we want to, uh, our car thing? We were starting to get into very sensitive areas. Because the moment you talk about that, you're talking about culture, etc. And it's a whole, di it's now becomes a value di argument, not an economic argument. And who's going to make the trade-off, etc. So, and the Europeans, by the way, are just as, uh, the only person who l looks at all of this area as, in effect, an entertainment industry as an industry, are the Americans. The rest of the world have all looked at it. This is culture. This is this is not only economics. This is much more. There's much more at stake at here. It has to do with our identity, our cult, our reflection, etc. And so, I don't think a, you're going to see a much liberalization in, in in that whole area. Thank you very much for the talk. You touched on the. Uh, trend from beauty contest to auction. Can you comment on whether that is something that we're seeing internationally in, in other non-US markets? And do you also think it's the right direction and why? Well, it depends what your aim is. You know, if, if your aim is maximize money for the, for the for, if you look at it as a good that's selling it, obviously auction is the best way of doing it. You get the biggest <laughs> price. And 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 you get seen big players. You know. If your aim is to to reach people, making sure that you reach uh, p 
people or connect people who necessarily economically it doesn't make sense to do, then it, it, that may not be the best, uh, best way. That's why beauty contests, surely, you know, we call them beauty contests, what it really means is you set conditions. We, you want to achieve A, B, C, D. Which one of you can best achieve it? And whoever best can achieve it, you give them the license, etc. And uh, I, uh, I am, of course, the op as always, the op balance is try to mix the two, try to um, put enough conditions out so it's still marketable and then have an auction so you get in. That's what most that, that's what everybody is trying. But there are some areas where it just doesn't make sense to, to auction off. But it be, depends very much what you're talking about. You know, if you're talking purely on spectrum, etc., uh, as I mentioned, I think one of the, we want to drive innovation, make more spectrum available without specific use. That, I think, will be far more effective. Than, and that you would do, uh, again, probably on a, a, not on an auction basis, but on a, but either for free or subject to conditions, you know. On the other hand, if you're trying to, as we're doing now, we're selling the 700 spectrum. I have no problem with selling it through auctions because it's the best, best part of the spectrum. It is the one that everybody wants. And we do have already three providers. And just putting a fourth one in doesn't necessarily result in a competitive market. So. I find this somewhat oversimplified saying, you know, let's have four competitors. That doesn't mean we need to have a competitive market necessarily. But given the, where we are, not auctioning off would be criminal. This is really valuable space. You, know. you raised the, or pointed to the interesting issue of the support for Canadian content. Uh, so a couple of questions in that regard. In one direction is, how does one make a judgment about what the appropriate amount of support is? And the other question is the different modalities of that support. I don't know a lot, but I think there are tax credits, there's federal provincial issues, there's you know the CBC which produces it directly versus people who are subsidized to do it. Well, let's start, start with the modalities. I mean, right now, if you want to produce something, there's a host of, uh, of funds that you can access the support, etc., et both on provincial basis, federal basis, through uh, uh, producers, uh, through broadcasters, things that we have mandated. We have something, for instance, uh, called benefits policy. That means if you buy another company, 10% has to be made available to the industry as large, etc., and it usually winds, a lot of it winds up in funds for the creation of films, etc., etc. But all, it is incredibly fragmented, and uh, we spend a huge amount of productive time just trying to uh, access all these funds. So I think we could. Uh, then comes the other question that you raised: who determines what should be done, etc. And uh, you know. We have tried in a, a very many which ways to do it. You usually try to do some sort of a peer panel making those determinations. And that's essentially the best way. It always degenerates into a self-serving uh, rotation. You have to change the people after a while. But I don't think anybody has come up with a better way of doing it. You know, if, First of all, it's, 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 it's a horrible business in terms of predictability. If anybody there tells you nothing, nobody knows what will sell and what will work. It's a crapshoot every time people will tell you in the broadcasting industry. So it's, uh, what, how do you fund them? You, you basically do a, you fund to a certain level that you think is, is, is required to make the system go. It's usually called incrementality. You know, we, what, I, what do you have? What sources do you have? How much more do you need in order to make it go? And are, you, are we willing to do it? Then the determination, which, who qualifies? I don't think we, we try to stay away from that. They'd rather not who qualifies, but just saying, OK, if that's what you want, have you got a customer for it? Or have you got, got, a, got a broadcaster or a, a distributor for it? And, then, and, and you put these six together. Now, it is more arts than science, and I don't think anybody has, this, has necessarily the right answer. The only thing I can't see is I'm not suggesting we improve the system. I wouldn't know how. But I don't know why it's so fragmented that you, go, you have to go to 50 sources in order to produce anything. I just uh, to say everybody should feel free to introduce yourself, if you choose so. 
Margaret McQuaig Johnston, former public servant and now senior fellow at the Institute for Science, Society and Policy. Uh, thank you, Conrad. Very insightful as always. Um, I'm really struck by the fragility of the regulatory system given the complexities that you describe. And looking ahead months or maybe uh, years, but it's, it's actually, I think, more months, at things like the, the Internet of Things, your refrigerator ordering food in real time from your grocery store and having it delivered, or your television in your family room looking like a computer screen and behaving like a con computer screen. So uh, again, to the convergence of broadcasting and telecom, this is getting really complex really quickly. And what is your sense uh, or faith that you may have or not have in the whole Canadian regulatory system or how we're interfacing with the US, which is a major player in all of this new technology, and our capacity to manage in the public interest? Well, I don't have any crystal ball more than anybody else. I just think we have, the, we have very old tools which are just not uh, appropriate for today, and we have uh, no focus on um, we, we really only fiddle at the edges uh, you know uh, whether you right, rightly wrong for instance obama when he came in power and i'm no friend of obama no no admirers of obama he from first one said you know he came in and within six weeks they came up with a with a spectrum policy and saying how we we the federal government in the u.s waste spectrum a huge amount of spectrum how can we free that up and auction it and for instance the navy owns this this uh, part of the spectrum across the country now i can understand why they need it in california but why do they need it in kansas you know and they should give it up and he made them give it up and they auction it off etc and they have a very little, had a long uh, and very detailed spectrum policy. Uh, they are continuing on it, you know. They, they see that's where it's at, that's where we have to do it, etc. Now the process is, if it's anything worse than ours, and, and, and God knows whether they'll get there, but at least uh, they have one, one outfit in charge, which is the FCC. They, uh, they don't make a distinction between broadcasting and, and telecom and the video. They basically look at communications holistically, you know, and 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 and, that falls. and I think we have to do the same. I think that's absolutely. And don't try to regulate it. Don't try to predict it. Nobody knows where it's going, and it's going so blastedly fast that you're always behind, etc. You just establish goals and establish a strategy. That's all. Would already be a wonderful thing. Hi, my name is Patrick Fafard. I teach in the Graduate School of Public International Affairs and an associate of the ISSP. I quite liked the end part of your talk where you offered sort of a radical agenda and then a more incremental agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you could sp talk a little bit though about how some of the sort of the, the big gorillas in the, in, the, in the game, I'm thinking about the Bell Canadas and the Rogers and some of the content providers, who lines up where in terms of what, whether they're in favor or opposed to regulatory change in, in what areas? Because it would be the first part of the question. And then I guess the second part of the question is, um, I, I heard an aphorism the other day that went something like, uh, the current government believes in markets but not individual firms. So they've made series of regulatory decisions that are actually quite intrusive for individual firms. And I'm also therefore interested um, if you have any sense of how that plays itself out in the sense that, you know, do, is, it the, is it the case that what we're up against is some very influential individual companies or conversely, ironically enough, not influential? Well, I don't know. The um, major players all understand the system. They use it to their advantage. You could, if you're unkind, you could say they're gaming it very effectively. And they're all worried that if you actually make a change, it's going to be so it's better the devil you know than you don't know. That's essentially the attitude there. They may push on one very small point, which is very discrete, discrete, and they know what the result will be, etc. But generally, I mean, I've, as I said, for five years I spoke to all of them, visited them, etc. You know, they all think, yeah, 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 you're absolutely right, but yeah, there is, there is generally no push. Uh, uh, for, from, uh, from them at all, and, and they have managed to make the system work for them. There's no question about it. 
uh, the second part of your question was uh, the, you may, some of these the, uh, changes we have made are very are somewhat intrusive, undoubtedly, but they are with good politics. Do not call this the perfect example, or you know, who who likes uh, called and it's good consumer protection. And yeah, if you speak to the people who are in 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 the direct marketing industry, they think it's horrible. But yeah, you know, they're more more of under us than them, so to speak. Uh, and so we will see a lot of consumer thing. The government's also very inconsistent on it. I mean, at one point in time, I was directed to redo our question because we are deterring investments and we were harming the big uh, telephone companies, i.e. Rogers, Bell, and Telus. Then the last six months, we've seen in a campaign by the government against them that they're not serving Canadians, you know, etc. cetera. So it's, there's, there's no great... Uh, 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 policy consistency that I have uh, seen. That's why I, uh, what I said in my talk is, you know, okay, if this is the order of the day, if this was the regime, if you know, they don't like big ideas, they don't like overall approaches, etc. What could one actually do incrementally to to improve the situation? I have uh, two more questions. Then we probably have to wrap up at some point, and there are refreshments in the back to think of that. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm Sharon Janaj, and I'm a senior fellow at the Center on Governance here at the university. Uh, also an ex-public servant. My last department was Canadian Heritage, so this is kind of uh, an interesting topic for me. Um, I'm interested in the institutional suggestions you were making about um, creating, recreating the old Department of Communications. And I'm wondering, in terms of, of what you've said, uh, should that uh, kind of reorganization be undertaken. Uh, what do you think about uh, the division of responsibilities between production and distribution in terms of communications? Would that be a more logical way of both funding and regulating uh, a digital uh, communications uh, strategy? Well, I think it's a bit, it's, it's, it's a bit late, you know, it, it, to make that distinction. I mean, they are now so intertwined, both technologically and corporately, that we, I, I, I don't know if, whether that would make sense. The, the old Department of Communication, I think, was the right idea ahead of its time, unfortunately. And I was there at, at the breakup, and I heard the argument that led to its breakup, but basically it was, that's wonderful, but it's really being cult captured by the uh, cultural side. And we are neglecting the technological development, and we're not doing enough in order to get our tele telecom industry, the TC, uh, uh, what do we call it, what's it, TC, TCTs, CTT, whatever the proportion is. Hmm? No, no, I am sorry. Forget it, it's old. Uh, they're not doing enough for this, this sector, and that's why taking it out and put it in industry and put it under the rigor of the Department of Industry, it will flourish and go forward, etc. I don't think that would happen now today. I mean, the, if this industry, there's no way that the cultural mafia for, would capture you know, the internet or could capture the Department of Communication in, in new way if you put, put it together. But on the contrary, because the industry is so converged, because people own both the distribution and the production, etc., I think we could uh, let's you could fashion a strategy by which both prosper rather than being seen as opposites, as trade-offs, as, 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 as opponents, That's, which is unfortunately what happens. You know, when you, you divide between production and distribution, you automatically assume that there are different interests and, and, and that, that, that they have to be reconciled. I'm not so sure that actually is necessary, especially now that we have common ownership across the board everywhere. Now, it, it, it's an interesting question. I, 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 I just think you have to, like a lot of ideas, there is a time to implement them or not. And I think this, this bus has passed. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Capel. I spent some time in the telecom consulting business. And um, my question, the, Richard, you mentioned in, in your talk that the, the Telecom Act, um, one of its main objectives was to provide the same level of service to all Canadians for about the same yeah. price. That was one of the reasons. And, and, and to do that, you had a huge infrastructure, phase two costing, phase three costing, all that stuff to do cro managing cross subsidization of a hugely complicated system. We're now at 2014, but now it's not voice pots, plain old telephone. Now it's high-speed services. We need to provide those ubiquitously across Canada. Presumably, it's going to be more costly to do that in the north. So we, are we still need that objective. Presumably, still exists. That we, that you, you're going to have to have some mechanism to provide that uniform. So my question would be. Would you propose the same kind of mechanism or some new way of doing that? Or, uh, because it was hugely complicated in the past. And just wanting your opinion on that. You mean equal high-speed access to, to all? It, at, at some cost. Well, some level of service, uh, uh, at some level. So presumably, you'd have to set what you think the minimum should be across Canada. But that's going to increase all the time, right? So presumably, there's always going to be the need to cross-subsidize certain areas, yeah. I would presume. You will recall, you're old enough, that when we had dial-up services, we actually Pots, ma yeah. made, made our dial-up part of uh, essential services. But we've never gone the next step one further up. The moment you go into high speed, etc., the, uh, the costs are so differential, and to, to try to equalize them in, 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 to any kind of regulatory scheme, what the governments have done at every level and is try to... Uh, in, build in incentives for the provision of high-speed uh, internet access to it, and or, the, or direct subsidy. And uh, I, I haven't heard anybody try to uh, say what you say, you know, trying to uh, uh, the essential lifeline access, uh, access to extend it to, it makes a lot of logical sense to high-speed, but uh, I, I, frankly, I don't even know how you would, where you would start. For, for, for first of all, the problem is how, fa how fast do you mean? You know, and, 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 and you know, are you talking one gigabyte? Are you talking five or whatever? It, 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 and it, it be, by the time you get your head around it, it's, 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 that whole universe has changed anyway. So, I would think it's, I would think it's something you should stay away from. Any last burning question by anyone? Okay, then uh, please just allow me to give you a small gift, branded University of Ottawa. Thank you very much. <laughs> and please join me. Thank you. Thank you.